Well, hello. We're going to talk a little bit about solutions, specifically solubility and how to read a solubility curve. Let's go ahead and get started. So when you hear the term solubility, it has a very specific definition that we'll talk about here. It has to do with how much solute can dissolve in a particular sol solvent. Um, when we think about solubility, I always think about it in terms of my own body, in terms of vitamins. Um, maybe you remember from your health class that some vitamins are water soluble, such as vitamin C. And because they're water soluble, you have to take them regularly as you'll, as you'll just, they'll pass through your body out with your urine. Um, other things are fat soluble. Those you have to be more careful with because if you accidentally ingest too many, they will stay dissolved in your fat and can become toxic to your body. Um, I'm a strong believer personally in taking uh, a multivitamin. I think your body doesn't always get uh, the micronutrients it needs. And over a lifetime of neglect of missing some of those nutrients, it can potentially have some health effects for you as you get older. Others will say it's expensive urine. Well, if it costs me $15 a year to take a multivitamin, I think personally that's a relatively inexpensive uh, insurance policy I'll do for my body. In terms of molecules, uh, we had discussed polarity of molecules and I just want to review with you very briefly what that had to do with. Molecules can be nonpolar and what that means is the electrons are shared equally. When you look at these, they tend to be rather symmetric. So an example of nonpolar molecules would be things like fats and oils. And I've drawn here a simple hydrocarbon. It's got one, two, three, four carbons on it. So this would be butane. It's a, it's a hydrocarbon, a nonpolar hydrocarbon. Now, polar molecules don't share electrons equally. And things that are polar are things such as water. And they actually have an extra pair of lone pair of electrons, two of them actually, on the oxygen that makes the oxygen more electronegative than the hydrogens there. So that's a polar molecule. Finally, I taught you earlier that like dissolves like. And what that meant is two nonpolar molecules can dissolve in one another and two polar molecules can dissolve in one another. So polar and polar will form a solution. Nonpolar and nonpolar will form a solution. But if you have something polar and something that's nonpolar, they will not be able to mix. They will form, at best when shaken, a suspension. Now, you can, of course, add an emulsifying agent to allow the polar and nonpolar to mix. Hopefully, you remember reading that in the article about soap. Now, your body definitely pays attention to solubility. Uh, for instance, water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C, you can take, you can actually take probably five or 10 times your daily recommended required dosage if you do that rarely, but it, it won't harm you as you'll simply pee out any extra vitamin C. Now, fat-soluble vitamins, things like vitamin A and vitamin D, those you must replenish regularly. Um, excuse me, th these are gonna be stored in your body in the fat and the problem is if you overdose on them, they will stay in your body and can become toxic. So you, that's why they put children's vitamins with a, a cap on there that small children can't take off easily, especially these gummy vitamins that taste and look like candy. You can imagine a small child of seven being able to open that and eating an entire bottle of vitamins, 50 vitamins, uh, could definitely be toxic and kill the child. Now, we also talked a little bit about anabolic steroids and human growth hormones. These are both fat-soluble uh, compounds that are stored in one's body. I think I gave you the example about Bob Hazelton, the boxer, who ended up losing both of his legs uh, from doing too much of these things. So, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to inject some of these uh, human growth hormones or take anabolic steroids and I'm going to become Superman. When in fact, that's not what happens. The, the, the reality is far worse than that. It can require hospitalization or even worst case scenario, it will cause death. 
Now, let's talk about some other real-life applications of solubility. When you take your clothes to the dry cleaner, there it's actually a misnomer, a misunderstanding. The, you hear the word dry cleaning, and you think somehow they're not going to get your clothes wet. Well, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Instead, what they do is they use a nonpolar liquid. Remember, water's liquid. So if water doesn't take out the stain on your clothes, you're like out of luck. So you bring it to the dry cleaner, and they use a nonpolar liquid that can dissolve the stain that's on your clothes. So polar liquids would damage wool and silk, so that's why you have to bring those expensive wool and silk things like ties and so on or sweaters to have them dry clean properly. Uh, the dry cleaning also works very well for taking out other nonpolar substances like ink and rust and grease. The material they use, or at least they used for a very long time, was called tetrachloroethylene. And here's the structure of that molecule. Now, if you look at that, it looks extremely symmetrical. If you cut it down the middle or left and right, it's extremely symmetrical, which means it's very nonpolar. Now, I said they used to use this compound. They don't use it anymore because it's been found to be a human carcinogen. That is, it causes cancer in man. They now use a different nonpolar liquid to clean the clothes when you bring them to the dry cleaner. All right, so let's now talk about how we can get polar and nonpolar things to mix. Perhaps you remember from your soap article, an emulsifier or an emulsifying agent will do that. What is an emulsifying agent? Well, it's a molecule that has both a polar and a nonpolar end on it. So it allows the polar end of the molecule to interact with the polar substance and the nonpolar end of the molecule to interact with the other substance. The polar and nonpolar then will get together. Some examples of emulsifying agents, well, soap is an example of an emulsifier. Think about if you get oil on your hands, uh, you put water, water will not take the oil off, but as soon as you put soap on your hands, the soap will mix with both the water and the oil and get that oil off your hands. Eggs are another, another emulsifying agent. Maybe you're going to bake a cake, and most cake recipes have oil and water in them. And eggs are what you use to emulsify, to get the oil and water to mix. I suppose you could use soap. It would be very bitter and taste nasty. Lecithin is something that's used. It comes from a soybean. It's used in candy bars to mix the oil and water in the candy bar. Some people are allergic to eggs, so oftentimes if you're a label reader on your food, you will see lecithin or soy lecithin as one of the ingredients, and it's simply to emulsify the fats, the oils, and the water in whatever you're eating. And finally, the last example of an emulsifying agent would be a detergent. Now, we'll talk briefly about what is different, how is a soap different than a detergent, and, and, and they do have some very specific differences. Well, let's look at a soap molecule in a very generalized form here. The uh, long tail here that I'm bringing the cursor go over is the nonpolar hydrocarbon tail. So there'd be a carbon here, 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 and here at the corners. And these are making about 109.5 degree tetrahedral geometry. And then on the end, you have a sodium ion that gives it a polar head. And I'll just... Hope you have read the soap article and understand what that molecule is trying to show you. So what are some differences between a soap and detergent? Well, soap, traditional soap, is made from animal fat or vegetable fat. That's vegetable oil that's been hydrogenated to turn to a fat. Here's a typical soap molecule, as I showed you. It has both a polar head and a nonpolar tail. Detergents are made from petroleum. That's like crude oil. And detergents were invented uh, generally in, in major use in World War II for sailors that had to use very hard water that had a lot of minerals dissolved in it. So detergents work very well in hard water. If you have a water softener at home, the water softener removes dissolved minerals in the water, which is nice because those dissolved minerals like calcium and magnesium and iron end up forming the soap scum or the kind of a white opaque stuff that goes on your shower door and then you got to clean that off every once in a while. That's not dirt from your body, that's simply the minerals that were in your water. 
Now they make different type products. Maybe you've heard of a, of a soap, well, they call it soap called Zest. And it says zestfully clean, leaves no soap residue. Well, of course it's not gonna leave a soap residue because it's a detergent. It's not going to leave any residue. Now a micelle is if you're washing, hand washing dishes and you've got a big oily spot in the sink, a big blob of oil, and then you got water. When you add the soap, what the soap does is surrounds the oil. And what we're looking at here, it's hard to see, but the little circle on the end, these look like pins, the, the little circle is the polar head and the little line is the nonpolar tail. So remember, the nonpolar tail is going to dissolve into the nonpolar oil. And so the soap is the, and that way is going to dissolve the oil. When the water, if we can personify it, looks at the direction of the oil, the only thing it sees now are the polar heads. So it also gets along and dissolves. The other way I like to think about this is emulsifying agents like soap are basically like a translator. So if oil is speaking, let's say Spanish and the water is speaking English, the soap is the translator between the two languages. All right, let's now get into how to read a solubility table. There will be several questions on your test. So this section is very important for you to understand and be able to do on your own. Now let's look at this graph over here. It says a solubility table shows the dependence of solubility on temperature. So what is solubility? Well, solubility, it says on this graph on the side here, grams of solute per 100 grams of water. So we're looking at that for both gases, those would be in dashed lines on my graph, and for solids, those are solids. And in general, I hope what you see is that for all the solids, the Ki, the sodium nitrate, the potassium nitrate, the ammonium chloride, the potassium chloride, the sodium chloride, as the temperature, that's the x-axis, as the temperature goes up, the amount of solute dissolves increases. And that's probably a relationship you're familiar with. If you've ever done any cooking, you know you can generally get more stuff to dissolve in hot water than you can cold water. Now, gases don't follow that pattern. In fact, they follow the opposite pattern. As the temperature goes up, the general slope for the hydrogen chloride gas, the ammonia gas, and the sulfur dioxide gas, as the temperature goes up, the solubility of that gas decreases. So solubility refers to the maximum grams of solute that will dissolve in 100 grams of solvent at a given temperature. At least for our graph, that's how we're defining it. It varies with temperature. As the temperature goes up and increases for a solid, you can get more solute to dissolve. For gases, as the temperature goes up, you will get less gas to dissolve. And it's always based on a saturated solution. Saturated solution refers to the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a solution. If we're looking at a food analogy, because I haven't eaten my supper yet for today, uh, like right now, I'm a little hungry. So as an as a analogy, I would be unsaturated. My body can hold more food. Now, if I go up and I eat and I stop eating when I'm full, I would be saturated. Now, if I had a really good meal and I ate everything and was full, I would say I'm saturated. And then somebody brings me my favorite dessert, like cheesecake. Well, I might go ahead and act like a pig and eat that cheesecake. At that point, I'd be what I would refer to as super saturated. In other words, I have too much food in my body and that's a rather unstable situation. More to come on super saturated solutions a little bit. So we mentioned some general trends. Solids are more soluble at high or low temperatures. Good, high temperatures. Gases are more soluble at high or low temperatures. Low temperatures, good in high pressure. If you can imagine a piston, uh, let, so let's look over here on our little side example. I've got a liquid, maybe this blue water here, and I've got some gas, little purple dots, and I've got a piston, this can be pushed up and down. As I push this piston down, I'm going to force more of these gas molecules to dissolve into the liquid. So in other words, if you have a high pressure, 
you can cause more gas to dissolve in a liquid. Think about a can of pop. It's under a pressurized container, and that's how they get the gas to dissolve. As soon as you open that container, you'll hear the pfft, and that's when the gas is leaving. If you leave and open up a pop and you leave it sitting outside or in a room and it warms up to room temperature and you go back and drink it, it's going to have lost its carbonation or much of it will be gone because gases are less soluble as the temperature decreases. Excuse me, increases. Pardon me. Um, I, I see the word example here, nitrogen narcosis. If you're a scuba diver, this is called the bends. You can go down as fast as you want scuba diving, but when you come up, if you come up too fast, nitrogen is dissolved in your blood and there's less air pressure, less water pressure pushing on your body as you go from the bottom, as you go up toward the surface. And what happens is the gas that's trapped in your body bubbles out and bubbling bubbles, gas bubbles in your body are very bad for you. It basically gives you a full body cramp and you can't swim. And so the, the, uh, the way you avoid the bends is as you're diving, if you need to ascend a great distance, you go up maybe 10 or 20 feet and you stay there for two or three minutes to let your body acclimate and get rid of some of that nitrogen. Then you go up another 20 or 30 feet and you continue to do this in a very slow manner and then you will not suffer from the bends or nitrogen sarcosis, narcosis. The other way you can deal with this is in your scuba diving equipment, you can just have oxygen mixed with an inert gas like argon instead of air. Air is about 77% nitrogen, so if you don't breathe any air going down and you're only breathing oxygen with an inert gas like argon, you can avoid the bends as well. We had talked about, and you were asked to read an article on hot packs, or I believe it was on cold packs, maybe both. And so we had talked about that those were a super saturated solution. So on the top, I have a hot pack, and it's got a super saturated solution in here with a little metal disc. And when you squeeze that little metal disc, there's what's called a seed crystal in there. And that seed crystal will cause this unstable super saturated solution to precipitate out, and as it does that, as some of the solute comes out of solution, it releases heat. These are reversible, and hopefully you understood from the reading how that works uh, from the article that you read. Cold packs work in the same basic fashion. They just have a different set of chemicals in there that when you squeeze them, they get cold instead of hot. Now, on the hot pack, they use a material called sodium acetate. So we're looking at a graph of solubility versus temperature. And as I mentioned, sodium acetate is a solid. As the temperature goes up, the amount of, of sodium acetate that you can dissolve in solution increases. The purple line represents the point of saturation, the point that you can't go above. Now, you can actually trick the solution. If you heat it up to a very high point, you can get more to dissolve in it and then you let it cool down very slowly and you will have trapped in solution more than what the solution wants. And again, I will go through that here in a little bit on a different slide. I wanted to see if we can go quickly to watch. I want to show you a super saturated solution when we add a seed crystal as this uh, seed crystal comes out of solution. So let's see if this is going to. We're going to try to go to YouTube. And here it is. I'll go ahead and play that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it. I hope you can. Let me... Here we have a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate in water. A supersaturated solution is an unstable solution where we have more compound dissolved than should be dissolved in the given amount of solvent at the temperature. The solution Obviously, is it's not working very well. We're we hearing some background sound. Here we have a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate in water. We see rapid water. formation of supersaturated of solution. solution. It's an unstable As solution. The solution moves where we have being more supersaturated. I apologize. We're having a few technical issues. Let's see if we can get rid of one. And we're going to let that run one more time for you. Hopefully, it's going to work better this time. 
Here we have a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate in water. A supersaturated solution is an unstable solution where we have more compound dissolved than should be dissolved in the given amount of solvent at the temperature. The solution is unstable, and if we add a small crystal of the compound, we see rapid formation of crystals as the solution moves from being supersaturated to being saturated. All right, we'll get back to that. Get rid of that part of it and get back to our presentation. All right. Now, let's just make sure we understand these terms in terms of um, an unsaturated solution is one that can hold more solid. In other words, if I have a test tube and I put a few crystals in there, and all of those crystals dissolve, I know that the solution was initially unsaturated. If it's saturated, it means that if I put three crystals into that solution, I will get three, solu three crystals to dissolve into the solution, but three more will precipitate out. In other words, it's sort of like uh, my eighth hour chemistry class. They're, they're really a very smart bunch of people, but by eighth hour, their brains are full. So if they need to, if they're capable, when they do learn in my class, it's because they had to forget stuff from earlier in the day. There's only so much information you can learn each day. Now, a supersaturated solution is one where if you put a single crystal in, you will get considerable crystallization to come out of solution, okay? Let me say this a different way. Let's use that food analogy. An unsaturated solution is a hungry individual, right? You're very hungry and when you eat, you can still eat more. I can put more solute into the solution. A saturated solution means you eat until you're full and then you stop eating. That's the way we're supposed to eat food. And that's not the way most of us eat. And a super saturated solution is one where you eat so rapidly, you put in more food than your body than you should. And it takes a few minutes for your body to know you ingested too much food. And then your response from that is, Oftentimes, we might throw up afterwards because we simply ate too much food. So in a supersaturated solution, if I can use that analogy, we put just a single seed crystal in and it became very unstable. And when I say it threw up, I mean that it crystallized out much more than I put in. Now, all of the solute doesn't come out of the solution. All of the solute above the point of saturation comes out of solution. I'm gonna drill down and talk a little bit more about that with you here shortly. So let's look at just this very simple example here, solubility versus temperature. And we wanna to try to answer some questions because again, this is what I'll be asking you to do on your assessment. So we wanna figure out how much solute can dissolve at a given temperature. So if something's unsaturated, it can hold more solute and it's below the line. So if I were to look at the potassium nitrate line, this dashed line, and I was at, let's say, this temperature right here, and I go up, and maybe it puts me right where the cursor is, and maybe that where the cursor is right here is 50 grams. Well, it can actually hold, let's say, 80 grams. So as long as I'm below that line, I'm unsaturated. To be saturated I means the solution has just the right amount of solute or you're on the line. So if I'm at a temperature and that temperature, the amount that I have in solution corresponds to the amount on the line of solubility, that would be saturated. If I'm somehow above the line at that temperature, I've got too much solute dissolved in it and I'm super saturated. Let's do some examples so you can see what I'm trying to explain to you here. So at this point, uh, I am definitely below the line if we're referring to any of them. If we're referring to uh, the KCL, I'm definitely below the line at that temperature, so I'm unsaturated. If, we look, if we're looking here, if we're looking at the KCL, I would be super saturated because I'm above the line for KCL, but I would be unsaturated for the line of KNO3 because I'm below the line for KNO3. And finally, if we move that line, well, 
let's move the line over here. If we, let's go back a second. So if we got to this point for a solution, um, like, well, I'm gonna skip that example for right now. Let me just keep moving on because I think I got some better examples for you here to do. All right, so let's let's move on here. So let's hit some some big ideas here, things that you need to remember. So when solids get dissolved in liquids, what happens? In other words, as the temperature goes up, will I get more or less solid to dissolve? You should get more, good. So as the temperature goes up, I'll get more solid to dissolve. So the line is gonna look something like this on my graph. So this is solubility versus temperature. So as the temperature increases, the solubility increases. Think about if you're adding sugar to hot tea versus cold tea, you can get more, to, more sugar to dissolve in hot tea. Now gases, on the other hand, are gonna follow a very different pattern. For gases, as the temperature goes up, you get less gas to dissolve. So as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. Maybe you've witnessed this when you open up pop and it, as it warms up, the pop becomes flat. Another way you maybe see this is you have a, a fish tank and you're, for whatever reason, didn't put a little bubbler in the tank and you put that fish tank maybe in, in a sunny window. And what happens is the sun shines on the window, warms the water up, and now you have less and less oxygen dissolved in there. So initially at low temperature, we got lots of oxygen to dissolve in there. But then as we warm it up, you're going to get less oxygen in there. And we continue to warm this up. What's going to happen is our poor little fishy is not going to have enough oxygen because it's too warm in the water. And so unfortunately for that little fishy, without oxygen, that's not good. You can see the little bubbles are leaving. The fishy is not making bubbles anymore. And then I think you know what's going to happen. Look away if you need to. That little fishy. He's not going to be in the in there swimming around very happy anymore. He's going to be he's going to be dead, All right? Oh, you can cry. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Um, let's now go ahead and do some some examples here. Um, so we want to try to describe these situations that I've given you as either unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated. So let's look at the first example. And each of these are in 100 grams of water. That's important to recognize the volume that it's in. So I have 80 grams of sodium nitrate at 30 degrees Celsius. So I find 30 degrees Celsius, and I bring that up till I get 80 grams, and I make a dot right there. Now I find the line. So see, I took the temperature, 30 degrees Celsius, I went up. I'm at the solute, 80 grams. I went over, I made a dot. You don't have to make your dot this big. Please don't. Next, find the line for sodium nitrate. Here it is. Am I above that line, on that line, or below the line? Well, I'm clearly below the line. So what type of solution do I have? Unsaturated. You got it. That's an unsaturated solution. Let's try the next one. The next one says 45 grams of potassium chloride at 60 degrees Celsius. Go to 60 degrees Celsius. Go up until you hit 45 grams and make a little dot there. Well, it looks like we hit right on that line. And if you're on the line, what type of solution have we made? Saturated. Very good. Next, let's try another one. We have 30 grams of potassium chlorate at 30 degrees Celsius. So find 30 degrees Celsius and go up to 70 grams and make a little dot right there where they intersect. Whoops, did I misread that? I did, I'm, I apologize. 30 grams of KCl, 30 degrees Celsius, right down here. Now let's find our potassium chlorate. Potassium chlorate is right down here. That's the line for potassium chlorate. We are clearly above that line, so we must have a good, super saturated solution. Let's try one more, okay? In the last example, we have 70 grams of lead to nitrate at 60 degrees Celsius. 60 degrees Celsius, go up to 70 grams, make a little dot. Now find the lead to nitrates right over here. And looking at that, here's the line for lead to nitrate. I'm making the cursor go over it. 
we are below that point, so it is unsaturated. Excellent. Now, you're saying, how can you possibly make this more difficult for me? Well, I can, and I probably will on your test. The chart is based on per 100 grams of water or per 100 milliliters. If I gave you the chart per 100 grams, but asked you, let's say, about how much solute I could get in a liter of water, you would have to remember to multiply the amount of solute you find on the chart by a factor of 10. And we should probably practice some of that so you don't get fooled on the test. So let's look at this example. Here's an, here's an example like that. It says, for every 500 grams of water, if I put 100 grams of potassium nitrate in at 40 degrees Celsius, what kind of solution would I have? Now, if you've been paying attention up to this point, but sort of playing a video game at the same time, you might miss this. So let's look. I have 40 degrees Celsius, and I have 100 grams of KNO3. So I'm going to put that little line on there. There's my KNO3, and I, I will make that point. And we'll go right up there. Now look at here. I stopped here because, let's draw that across. I'm going to call that point about 62 grams. Okay. So it, it says, and now some of you are like, well, I, I want to put 100 grams so I'm below that point, and you might call it unsaturated. Well, that might not be the right answer. It says that you can get 62 grams in 100 grams of water. So how much could you get in 500 grams of water? Well, we'd have to think about that, wouldn't we? The saturation point then says at 40 degrees Celsius in 100 grams of water, you get 62 or 63 grams of KNO3. So that if we want to be saturated at 40 degrees Celsius with 500 grams of water, five times more, I would need five times 63. I would need 315 grams of the potassium nitrate to be saturated at 40 degrees Celsius. And I only have 100 grams dissolved in there, which is far less than 315, so I must be unsaturated. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. Let's try another one. So now it says, describe each situation. We have 100 grams of water. That's good. That means we don't have to really worry about playing that game of multiplying by anything. And we have 100 grams of sodium nitrate at 50 degrees Celsius. So I went to 50 degrees Celsius, and I made a dot where they intersected at 100 grams up here of sodium nitrate. Now I looked at, I found the sodium nitrate over here. And if I were just extend that line, I'm clearly below that point. So this is an unsaturated solution. So I would anticipate all of the sodium nitrate would dissolve in 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius. Now let's pretend that I cool that solution very slowly. So I got it all to dissolve at 100 degrees Celsius. I boiled it at 50 degrees Celsius. So I got it very hot. I got it to dissolve. And now I very slowly cool that down to 10 degrees Celsius without shaking it, without doing much movement. So now, now it, it unfortunately moved my uh, graph a little bit, and I apologize. That should have gone over to the 10 degree line right here. That little dot should be right where I am now. Now notice at that point where the cursor is that we are now above the line of sodium nitrate. So if we cool it to 10 degrees Celsius, it's actually a super, super saturated solution. In other words, it's holding too much solute. It will still be clear because I tricked it into holding that. Like I, I ate food too quickly and I tricked it to stay in my body. Now, if you were to cool that very quickly, shock the system called quenching it, or you could put a seed crystal in, or you could take a glass rod and scrape the inside of the glass, any of these things would cause the system to become unstable. And what's going to happen is, however much above that line you were, we are right up here, that will fall down 
and it will come back down to the line right down here. So it'll start up here and it'll drop down to here. And so approximately 20 grams of sodium nitrate will come out of the solution when you do that. All of it won't come out. It'll stay saturated, whatever is there, but some of it will. And then it will be saturated at that point. Let's see if, what else we can talk about here. So this is just summarizing for you. When you're looking at a solubility curve, it talks about how much solute can be dissolved in the solvent at a specific temperature. Solids have a positive slope. In other words, as you increase the temperature, you get more solute to dissolve. And we see that for the potassium nitrate and potassium chloride. For gases like hydrogen chloride, as the temperature goes up, you get less gas to dissolve in. When reading a solubility curve, if you are, if you find the temperature and solute to be below the line, you are unsaturated. The system can hold more. If you are on the line, it is saturated and the system cannot hold any more. If you are super saturated, you are above the line. I have a few examples for you to do here. You can try these on your own. So the question, I've left you a solubility curve and I've left the question here and you can move around on the map to see what's happening and see if you agree with my answer for those three. You might need to hit pause in the video as you do this. Once you finish that, I'll give you a few more to do as well. And so here's a few last examples that you can do. Look up these situations and see if you agree with what I've done here. All right, I hope that helps. Um, please email me with questions as always, and good luck with your studies of chemistry. Bye-bye.